You know, it's been a while since we last checked on Russia. I wonder what they've been up to. Okay, so nothing good then. In the deep dig site known as the Kola Super Deep Borehole, the Russians would do what Russians do best and run across something that likely they should have never messed with in the first place. Really can't blame them, the US does it all the time. It's really just kind of a human trait to, I don't know, we just kind of screw around and finding out is divine. As they continue to dig past the 6,000 meter mark, they would ultimately make it to 12,262 meters, or roughly about eight miles in freedom units. In our universe, they would stop there because of the heat. But the actual story is they found something down there. At first, wholly unsure about what to do, they would bring in more help when people started acting strangely, but this would do very little to mitigate the issue. As time passed, Anna Fedrova, which I'm pretty sure I pronounced that right, would begin to understand just what was down there, and also get the concept that if this ever escapes, the human race is pretty much completely boned. So in today's episode, we'll be discussing the findings of the movie Super Deep, as well as how it affects humans, where does it come from, and how it got trapped down there, and ultimately why humans were never really meant to be dwarves digging in the landscape, because do you want an old god? Because that's how you get an old god. Also, I just wanted to add, I literally got unsubscribed from this channel on my other channel, which is pretty hilarious, so if you want to check that out and see if it happened to you, it probably did. Support is always appreciated, otherwise let's get to it. But first, this episode is sponsored by Upside. So I just drove across the country from like Denver to Atlanta, and I don't know if you've seen the gas prices, but holy sweet God, that was a terrible idea. But you know what actually made it bearable? Using Upside. Upside is a cashback app that enables you to get more value out of your purchases and improves profitability of local businesses. In layman's term, I opened up the app, saw who was offering the cheapest gas in the area, picked the cheapest one, and was able to fill up my car with gas for actually $4.57 instead of it being the advertised $4.89 on the sign out front, which that's like 32, that's not like 32 cents, it is 32 cents a gallon, which as you might guess, adds up. I ended up getting $2.35 cash back from the purchase, which if you travel for a living or you drive a lot like me, you could end up saving a lot. But it can also be used at restaurants as well with over 30,000 businesses and 25,000 gas stations across the 48 states. And honestly, it's actually pretty cool. The businesses get your business, which helps them, and you get cheaper rates. Plus, with no limit on how much you can earn back, you can transfer the upside cash out, which is actually a real money, by the way, it's not a point system, through your bank, PayPal, or just put it on an e-gift card to Amazon, Starbucks, or dozens of other places. Me personally, I'm just going to keep using it from here on out because this is actually pretty sweet. Plus, by sharing Upside with friends, you can increase your earnings by getting an extra 15 cents off a gallon with the first time that you use it. Just remember though, you have to use a credit card or debit card. It doesn't work if you just pay cash. So if that interests you like it does to me, then to get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play and use my promo code GAMING to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. So, we kick off our story in typical Russian fashion. I have no idea if funding for movies is difficult over there, but there's like 20 media companies again. Sort of like what we saw with Sputnik, but with this one, there's literally one called just a media studio. Not suspicious at all, just enjoy the movie. What do you mean, where did the 20 million rubles come from? Although I gotta give it to the Russians, lately they seem to be the only ones with interesting film ideas. So, a doctor approaches a man in a bed who's not doing so hot. As she texts his temp, actually he's doing really hot, cause he's burning up. He goes to inject him with a vaccine and as she she does, man, he starts bleeding everywhere and just sort of flatlines out. Other doctors come in to assist, but I'm guessing massive hemorrhages all over the body, leading to exsanguination. There really is no coming back from that unless you just start replacing lost blood. But they have none of that on hand, apparently, and he flatlines permanently. So now we meet Anna Fedrova. She is writing a report on the vaccine being total crap that she just created, discussing how her colleague ran it on himself and just completely bypassed animal testing, which is always a good idea. Also, I know you can't hear it, but this has been translated into English, and I don't I don't know if they hired a bunch of YouTubers to read the lines, but it all sounds extremely disjointed. Like, the sentences absolutely do not translate an emphasis at all. If you haven't seen it, you gotta watch it. But it's like someone slamming on the brakes literally mid-sentence sometimes. So moving on, she's big sad because, well, her colleague just dropped and she suggests that the vaccine program needs to be shut down permanently. She's apparently making the vaccine that everyone will need very soon, but isn't actually told anything about it. And then she sort of mentions how she should have run it on herself, which, okay, but that would have totally, like, taken you out too. Then a man tells her, don't worry bro, we've got plenty of meat suits to test on, so it's all gonna be okay. Meanwhile, at a Christmas party, but wait, it's actually a New Year's party, everyone seems really awake for being this late. And now, me officially being 30, I don't even care if I stay up for New Year's. Like, I don't know how they're doing it. But then Anna gets a call on the phone. It turns out the Communist Party was inside the house the whole time. And stupid jokes aside, someone on the phone tells her it's time to get to business. New Year, new chance to accidentally exterminate the entire human race, am I right? There's an incident at the Cola Super Deep Borehole. There's a 
apparently a research lab, and they need her to come in to examine an unknown disease. And just like that, she's off with a bunch of Russian soldiers to the Arctic borehole. As they land, people are boarding a bus. Quadrupeds are barking, and in general, it looks pretty cold. But the soldiers get ready as they spot a scientist coming towards a helicopter. Soldiers on the other side then take some pot shots, landing them, but the guy gets back up rather easily. As he continues to approach, he pulls out the old concussive baseball and detonates it in his hand. Then we get the absolute most real version of what tinnitus sounds like, which is panic inducing as whenever my tinnitus starts freaking out, that's exactly what it sounds like. Thank you, I hate it. But everyone managed to survive the explosion, except for obviously the scientist, and they go and check on the scientist, who is now just a pile of meat. Now, actually, he's pretty much just a puddle. Anna goes to secure a sample from the meat pile where she meets Sergi. And I know, his name isn't Sergi, it's Sergei. He asks her where she's from, because he recognizes the accent, and that'll be the running theme here. Next, we meet Hitman, the guy from Hitman. You'll see in a minute. And I'm literally gonna call him Hitman, or maybe Agent 47. I haven't decided yet. Also, when they are standing there talking, you can literally see from the shadows of their face that doesn't match the area that they're standing in. So it makes me think of like the 60s movies and how they just stood in front of a green screen. So, Anna says that they need to examine the people on the bus. Upon entering, you have one guy that just kind of wants to go home and is talking crap to everybody, and then another guy who seems really freaked out and says that everyone needs to leave. She tests everyone and they all come back clean, but they warn her what's underground is literal hell. Which, actually, yeah, it is. You'll see later. So we now meet Peter. He's simply a nerd who doesn't properly wear his jacket because it's easier to do that for some reason. As they drive into Earth's borehole, they have a nice chat with another doctor who's talking about the Hippocratic Oath and how they're required to not do any harm. Acting suspicious. Hmm. And I hope this guy doesn't try to, like, you know, sink the facility or anything to save humanity. And again, now you can see what I'm talking about. Inside of the van, the guy does look like the dude from Hitman. So the doctor puts in the wrong code a few times to make a point. For some reason, the elevator will fall if they mess it up three times, because why not? Also, you'll learn this is the most unreliable elevator in the world. Peter and Anna talk about the differences between a microbiologist and an epidemiologist, which if you didn't know, microbiologists study the organism itself and learn about it independent of outside influence, or at least that's what I was typically tasked with. Whereas an epidemiologist are like disease detectives looking for what caused the outbreak and how to prevent it from spreading. To do that, you also need to learn about the organism, but the details aren't as deep. I guess you could probably say that. Your main goal is to stop it. Although to be honest with you, there's a ton of crossover because as you learn about something, your brain naturally drifts towards, okay, well, how do we stop it? That or I should take up probably being an epidemiologist in the future because that's what I always thought, which uh, who knows, you know, YouTube's not forever. So as they descend, it begins to get very cold as they have entered the permafrost layer. But as they descend, they are speeding up, which is not ideal because something is wrong. The doctor gets up and depressurizes the cabin and puts on a mask, leading everyone to just sort of go unconscious. Now, I don't really understand how he depressurized it when they are underground. There must have been a reason. But you would think the pressure would be greater down there. So he then repressurizes it and everyone eventually wakes back up and now the hunt begins for Dr. Humanity. Agent 47 checks to see if the key was still in the elevator, but it's missing. And that's when the rest of the soldiers then fan out to go find the doctor. You know, the doctor, if he did want to save his own skin, could just tell everybody, oh, I hit the wrong button, my bad. But as they move through, they enter one room with a man named Nikolai and a woman named Kira, basically an engineer and a doctor. Agent 47 awkwardly stands near a collage as Anna takes samples of the water and then runs tests on Nikolai and Kira. They appear not infected. So, okay, as Anna sits there, the doctor comes out of the elevator, right, and then tries to tell her about what's happening as she totally narks on him, and then we hear him take some lead and then do the Wilhelm scream, which was actually pretty hilarious. But as he was able to head down the elevator, that means they don't have the elevator. So soldiers begin then trying to break down the door with writing all over it about demons and hells in there and all that good stuff. And then they find, written in Latin, insatiable hunger. Now, if Dead Space has taught me anything, you never want to open those doors. But they do, because of course, and then send a few soldiers down into the area known as Sahara. It's 200 degrees Celsius, which comes out to almost 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, Nikolai says, don't get yourself fried with the others. Yeah, that's that's how long the pause was. It was bizarre. Again, the translation is hilarious. So, as they turn to leave, well, they are sealed in without protection, which, uh, as you might guess, also isn't ideal. The door opens up to reveal a woman has hoofed it up the tunnel. She appears disheveled, and, I mean, she did just walk through a literal oven to get there. So, as she sits there, she is shivering, but doesn't remember much. They check her temperature and see that she has a severe fever. As they undo the back of her gown, they see that she is completely infected with something. It apparently doesn't hurt, but it looks really gross. They take a sample from her, and 
and check it under the microscope. As she looks, she realizes that it's a cellular parasite of some kind. It spreads quickly, but it appears to be a mold, to which now the patient is having the mold go through her body, lighting up the skin red. And it goes on to say the mold and fungi are some of the most understudied form of life, which arguably, yes. As they go to check on the patient, she's not looking too good. Anna goes to get help, leaving Kira in there to watch the patient, which I think bugs her later because it's like, well, you'll see what happens. Anyways, Nikolai now gets the lift started and Kira sees Olga standing in the window. So things are about to kick off in the worst way possible. Her hand begins twisting and breaking, which seems kind of painful. And then she begins running into the glass head first to break out. Agarov starts screaming to fall back on the radio to Sergei as the doctor comes over to the intercom talking about how he's going to bring the whole place down. Meanwhile, Anna is having straight up hallucinations, so that's not good. Definitely not a sign of things to come as the doctor then detonates the fuses in the facility to depressurize it. Nikolai then crushes a Pepsi can because it's Pepsi and also I guess to demonstrate what's going on and what's going to happen to them once this whole place depressurizes. Sergei wants to head down to get his men but Agent 47 tells him that they're going up and that's an order. Anna and Sergei then head in to get Olga and Kira but find the room is covered in mold. They find the window has been broken and then find Olga on the floor who's still alive as the mold has taken over her meat suit and she's half melted. Her eyes then glaze over a minute later as they grab a sample and Sergei takes a mold shot to the face. Then that continues to just fill up the room as Anna goes and grabs a gas mask so that she can breathe without being infected. As she approaches, oh look it's Kira. She mentions how her body isn't responding normally, her nervous system is compromised, and her muscles keep making her walk along without her actually wanting to and that she's extremely cold. She then has her chest burst open with stalks as she attacks Anna. Anna trips and then literally starts tripping like straight tripping man and hallucinating about falling. She sees her colleague as the fire suppression system appears to start working. She grabs the extinguisher and cools off the area to get rid of the mold, having Nikolai spray her with CO2 to get rid of any mold that may be on her clothes. I'm guessing she was running out of air in that mask because she rips it off and starts breathing heavily. Anna now goes to Sergei to see if he's infected, which of course he is. He knows it, Anna knows it, and the mold knows it. 47 now confronts Peter about the fungus. He suggests it's like cordyceps. So pretty much the last of us, right? Well, this is all about to get very familiar. Peter says the fungus wants everyone there to return to the nest so it can infect all of humanity. And now Anna has it figured out. The fungus cannot survive in a cold environment. It's controlling humans, telling them that they are cold because it can just barely survive in our bodies. But it still can definitely survive. Outside of the body, the mold quickly crystallizes and expires. Anna suggests that they send a biological team to take this thing out as it's too complex for the group that they have. Anna also blames herself for all of this. I'm not really sure why. And 47 talks about how they're in a war and that they need military dominance before their nation falls apart. Because if it does and they don't have that dominance, then all of this was for nothing. They plan on taking Sergei to Moscow in a hazmat suit, seeing as he's the sample. So they get ready to leave. Egorov then calls Sergei, telling him that they are meeting up in the tunnel. So an argument breaks out as to what they're supposed to do because they're right behind the door. Peter then shuts the door, opening the tunnel as a few of the soldiers enter the tunnel. Which, ah yes, very good. Send more into the meat grinder. Well, we hear squelching in the distance as Sergei's infection is also looking worse. And then we hear lead being thrown around the tunnel, but like deeply in the tunnel. Nikolai says that they need to close the door and then the soldiers come back dragging the sergeant as 47 questions who they were taking pot shots at. They didn't really know, but it was apparently big. As they help the sergeant, another soldier begins walking up. <laughs> oh lord, he's got an arm off. He goes walking down the tunnel, looking back. He then decides to create another mouth lower on his neck for extra air, as he knows what's back there, and he's not too keen on hanging out with it. The door then closes as the sergeant cries in the corner, talking about the attack. He says it knows that they are there, and you can hear something on the other side of the door. But you can't, but I could. Sergei continues to look worse. They now nope out of there as the creature breaks through the door and inside of the complex, squelching and screaming. Screaming. God, I hate that word. They now get to the elevator as Nikolai attempts to get it running. Sergei says that he can feel his infection taking hold as he's beginning to morb. Old meme, but it still checks out. Which, uh, also completely unrelated. I said oof in a YouTube comment, like, back in 2021. And some dude was like, oh, imagine saying oof in 2022. Needless to say, I'm, I'm absolutely stunned by people's inability to read dates on when things were posted. But back on track. They decide to leave Sergei behind as he's changing too fast. Sergei asks Anna if she's from Yugoslavia, to which she says she'll answer when she gets back and he's turned into a fungus man or something. So boarding the worst elevator of our time, they go further down into the facility, which I thought they were trying to get out, but I guess not. I mean, it does make sense later, I suppose. But as they descend, oh, well, we look at that. Once again, the elevator sucks and begins breaking apart. So here's the thing. The engineer is doing something with the wires, right? But can't get it to stop. So Anna makes her way over and pulls the emergency brake, saving all of them. Why the engineer wouldn't think of this is well beyond me. And how did she know how to do that? 
Well, that's beyond my pay grade. As 47 walks in, he finds spent casings and also that the entire place is frozen over. Apparently, the cooling system is malfunctioning really bad. Nikolai lights a flare to reveal that on the wall, pretty much everyone who was down there is fused together, which is exactly what the doctor was trying to stop from getting out. The recording goes on to say that the mold is fusing the bodies together for warmth and energy, but this one on the wall still got too cold as it's negative 15 degrees or 5 degrees Fahrenheit, and as a result, the normal human metabolism was not able to keep the mold warm enough. The doctor also sabotaged the cooling suits so they can't go outside to find the doctor's key. Agent 47 now decides that he will go out and get that key. He tells Anna to ask for the general when she gets to the surface as he will take care of her. Anna tells everyone left that they need to keep quiet about what's down here. Peter is looking dejected because he's a giant nerd who's worried about being a great scientist. He starts to panic that maybe the Soviet government would just leave him there, which, I mean, it's not the most unbelievable thing. Anna then checks the watch and realizes that 47 has been gone way too long. Also, he's the colonel. I, I know, I gotta tell you, he's actually the colonel, which is why he was able to order people around, but 47 is better. She puts on a gas mask and then heads out immediately stopping because it's pretty freaking hot down there. In fact, it is said that the rocks and the borehole at this depth were more like plastic instead of rocks. Walking across the bridge, she finds 47 crawling, but he's basically done at this point as uh, his ocular cavities are ruined and he's burning. She grabs the key from him and begins her painful trek back across the bridge before ripping off her mask so she can see, revealing the worst sunburn I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the mold is upset at her presence, or maybe happy at her presence, and begins turning red. She's able to make it back inside and in great pain. Basically, her outer layer of skin is cooked. So at this point, Peter completely loses his mind and pops Nikolai in the leg. Peter goes on about how everyone will know him and they won't think he's a dork anymore, and maybe a woman might actually kiss him someday. You know, standard scientist stuff. And as they all head back to the elevator. But Big Scary Monster Thing is still in the room somewhere upstairs. Peter orders Nikolai to go, the man he just put lead in his leg, but he can't, so Anna decides to go. She ends up spotting a lead dispenser in the elevator, grabbing it as Peter walks up because he decided to follow her, even though she was supposed to basically be the bait. She asks where Nikolai is, and he's like, oh, you should go check to see if he's still alive. <laughs> and as he does this, the thing then just falls on him, absorbing him into the pile. We see a bunch of screaming faces as everyone literally is just connected to this meat machine. Anna completely nopes out of there like anyone would, but this thing is aware of where she just ran. It begins tracking her as it enters the room in a style almost like really reminiscent of The Last of Us 2 where you find the Rat King. Also, you can, but well, you can't, but in the movie, you can hear everyone who's a part of this thing still consciously there and in an incredible amount of pain, which is a major bummer. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that's why one of the soldiers gave himself a new mouth. So as Anna runs into the freezer to hide, it's a horror movie, so it wouldn't be complete without someone ditching as much clothing as possible. She drinks some of that good Russian vodka and then dumps ice water on herself, which burns really bad if you have a burn, by the way. And she's like 99% burned. So I think she did this to prevent infection because it doesn't like to be actually on anything cold or possibly lower her outside body temperature tremors to style so that the creature wouldn't notice her. Not really sure which or how she actually figured that out. So she gets underneath the creature and then grabs the key from Peter and then heads outside to the elevator. She finds Nikolai who's having issues with the blood loss, but as they hobble along, the creature bursts through the wall to begin the hunt once again. We see one of these guys has like chicken wings arms, which is also reminiscent of the GTFO male sleepers. As they get into the elevator, it does this thing where it literally pushes out an entire human spine to try to reach Anna, who doesn't attempt to roll out of the way. I can't say that I would do the same, just straight up do a barrel roll, but they're able to get out of there before they turn around and spot Sergey, who, well, you know, he's not actually looking too good, but he still has some functionality mentally, Captain Key's style. He's essentially completely fused to the center pillar. He begins talking to Anna as he coughs up spores as this thing is in his lungs. He tells her to do something because this is honestly probably worse than meeting your end. So she elects to drop the elevator. Nikolai is like, no bro, I'm not meeting my end down here, which is kind of a reasonable response. I mean, honestly, Anna has been playing it fast and loose the whole time with her life since like her partner dropped. She grabs the key as Nikolai grabs the key also, which activates Sergei's almonds. She tries kicking, but as he goes for the old air deprival method, Sergei has reached full activation and hits Nikolai through the neck with sort of like his radius or what was left of his radius and ulnar bone, taking him out in the process. Sergei tells Anna to crash the elevator as she kisses him, but he's pretty much gone at this point. And 
and leaking lots of spores. As the elevator continues to ascend, she realizes that she just infected herself like a complete putz. With the mold taking over, she attempts to turn off the elevator, but it's already up too high and continues. She attempts to put in the wrong code to send it crashing, but she's grabbed and pulled out before the elevator can fall. Bro, why didn't you just type one, like, a bunch of times, three times over? No idea. So the elevator falls, and she's brought into the van to be taken to the surface. While in there, she's able to grab the spicy egg from a soldier and exits out of the van to basically reenact what the scientist did earlier. They try to tell her to calm down, which is about the last thing you want to do, and it appears they then knock her out with an injection before she can pull the pin and count to what? So, with new information comes new ideas and new explanations. One of the greatest inventions that humans, or at least one of, not like the greatest, but one of the greatest inventions that humans have come up with has to be the electron microscope. This machine has made it possible to look at things as tiny as a virus in a very large way, shown detailed rendering of cells, and in general has opened up our species' eyes to the micro-universe that exists all around us in the way the compound microscope never could. And because of this, it's time we learn what could actually happen to your meat suit when it gets jacked with you still at the helm. Our bodies are complex machines. If everything doesn't work together just so, or something influences certain actions in their operations, then that can completely alter how everything operates further downstream. Now, how are these two things related to one another? Well, because now we have the capability to explore and understand the actual pathophysiology of a disease in a way like never before. Not only in ourselves through things like sample taking, but through other animals and how diseases specifically affect them, which would have some merit concerning our own bodies. But to understand how this mold is afflicting humanity, which I guarantee is not in the way that you think it is, we must first quantify the actual symptoms of this disease as it takes hold within the Homo sapiens race. The first thing to happen to a person is the initial exposure. Once exposed, the mold will enter the usual pathways, that being the respiratory system. It appears as though the mold does not have the capability of entering the body through the skin, as this remains a viable barrier, barring likely some massive wound, but even still, a person would likely succumb before the infection spread far enough to convert them, although likely they would just be turned into pure energy or essentially biomass for the mold at that point. Upon getting into the oral or nasal passages, it would then spread to the lungs. Now, typically when a fungus or mold enters the lung, the immune system is primed and ready and already patrolling the area to specifically stop this. I mean, think about it. Your lungs are dark, warm, and moist, the perfect breeding ground for mold to grow. Without the immunity in this area, your lungs would be overwhelmed in days, which as you might guess, if we were all like this, that would be the extinction of our species. In fact, everybody always thinks like aliens and stuff would have to come down and fight us for Earth, but all they would really have to do is basically just release something into our atmosphere that would suppress the lung's innate immunity, and we would just drop in a few days. That has nothing to do with anything, but this is a science fiction science channel. Anyhow, once in the lungs, one of two things would happen. Either the innate immunity would be overcome, as this is a mold and the body has never really encountered it before, or something is released that suppresses the local immunity. I believe it to be the latter over the former. Cordyceps, for instance, is known in some ways to soothe the immune system response with a bidirectional modulator that will not only calm, but in other ways can also boost the immune system. In this scenario, however, it appears to just straight up suppress the immune response. Once this is done, the cells would no longer attack the incoming mold spores in any great capacity, and as a result, they are free to move deeper into the lungs. This all happens very quickly as when Anna is exposed to the spores from Sergei, minutes later, she already has the mold bioluminescence moving through her body via the circulatory system. It is possible she was infected earlier, but there is no clear point that you can look at and suggest that this happened. The hallucinations experienced do not seem to track with any other person who was infected and likely could just be a result of the trauma that she experienced. Once entering the lungs, they would then move into the alveolar sacs, and from there, they would have a straight shot into the capillaries, then to the pulmonary veins. Using this highway, they were quickly pumped around the body, where the infection would move into the musculature of the person, as well as potentially the brain. However, the brain itself may be spared in some capacity, at least at the beginning, due to the blood brain barrier being in place, this would make it difficult for the cordyceps within the bloodstream to actually cross over into the neural area. However, regardless of the brain's resistance at first, the infection would still hijack the body despite host intervention, or I suppose lack of host intervention. As the mold spreads, the immune system would likely become more and more suppressed to this ancient cordyceps influence on the macrophages and T cells in general, based on what we have seen. This would allow it to rapidly spread as seen when Anna looks under the microscope. Using the body's tissues as fuel, it would ultimately 
find its way into the musculature of a person prior to finding itself into the brain. And this is important to understanding not only its infection routes, but how we even know that it might be cordyceps in the first place. To take you back, there's an idea that cordyceps infects the brain and controls the body. But again, with newfound information comes new ideas. Utilizing electron microscopes, we've actually found that cordyceps doesn't so much take over the neurons as it does the actual musculature. Within ant jaws, when they are forced to leave the nest and then bite onto a leaf high up to spread the spores of cordyceps, a muscle tissue sample was taken to find that the cordyceps filaments were actually penetrating the muscle itself and not the neuromuscular junctions, which relays information from the brain. This is huge as it suggests the muscles are having a material secreted into them, causing the muscles to contract, but the brain is still functional. The cordyceps is just at the wheel. How this translates in importance is when we hear Kira say before she begins the attack, stating her nervous system was compromised and her muscles are forcing her to walk means that her brain is still functional. She is talking, understanding that something is up with her body, but unable to actually influence control. Sort of like an electrical shock causing your muscles to seize up or a cramp. Your brain is still technically in control, but the muscle is operating independently. Because of this, we can assume, like with this information gathered from the muscles with an ant jaws, so too is the cordyceps moving into the body and sending out filaments into the muscles of humans on a massive scale, leaving the neuromuscular junctions in place and functional, but seizing this control. The horrible part about this means that your sensory neurons are still quite intact, which means when Olga's fingers break, yep, she probably definitely felt that. When Kira has filaments break through her chest, she also feels that. When the giant meat monster shows up and everyone is screaming, it's likely because their nervous systems are linked in some capacity, so if anybody feels any pain at all, it is transferred to all of them. And considering the state of their bodies, imagine just exposed wet muscle being walked on with like the weight of 10 people. It's probably incredibly painful. Ultimately, however, the brain would likely be in a state of shock as the cordyceps really doesn't appear to be overly interested in the actual neurological functions of humans, more with just their muscle. Every person you've seen trying to return home, so to speak, may be compelled to do so, but more likely it's just the cordyceps controlling the muscle. However, I do believe at a certain point for the cordyceps to compel the person to return home, it would need to become acquainted with the central nervous system. And if you'd like to know more about how this may be possible, I've actually covered the four stages of infection concerning the cordyceps in The Last of Us videos, which are pretty extensive. So if you'd like to watch those, I will post, I think, the first one at the end of this video, so then you can just watch them all or do whatever you want to do. But to keep this succinct, the overall process would, as you've seen, require fusion of many different people, which historically is not what an independent multicellular organism wants to do. Look no further than an organ transplant for proof of that. I believe this is another supporting fact when it comes to it being cordyceps. Again, due to the cordyceps' natural ability to subdue the human immune system, this would be step one towards creating the meat machine. With the immune system in a calm state, another person nearby could begin the process of fusing with another without the host's immune system attacking that other person, as this can even be inspired by something as simple as a blood transfusion. We see the fungus will begin breaking down the integument system, sending out filaments, which would then link up with another person nearby, drawing them closer together. Once this happens, considering the fungus's ability to alter the physiology of a person, bone would be snapped, ligaments torn, and muscle would take on a new shape that would then start connecting to another host skeletal system. And again, as you might imagine, that's pretty painful. Once the process is complete, this would give the mold the ability to exist as a sort of platform form running through the body with several brains attached and likely internal organs as well because they are still able to scream. In Sergei's case, because he was alone, we see in the early stages where the mold will actually fuse a person to the wall and have branching mycelium reach out looking for other colonies of mold in which they can link up as then they will begin drawing the bodies together. Clearly, this has the capability to create a giant meatball in Central Park that would likely look like what we could all see if humanity was consumed. And I really hope you've seen that graphic because actually, Matt, can you put that up on the screen? Yeah. See, you're a part of this meatball if this gets out. Thanks, Russia. But lastly, I bet you're asking yourself, what is this even doing down there in the first place? You aren't? Well, we're going to be nerding out on this channel, so uh, let's wrap that up before we finish this thing out. A long time ago, Earth was a pretty warm place. So warm that even places like Antarctica had rainforests that actually then were snowed out, and it looks like it is today. There's an entire continent that we can't even use. It kind of sucks. But specifically with the Kola borehole and where it is located, it's next to the Norwegian Sea. As you might guess, it's pretty cold, so 
so what did we have there? Well, we'll have to go all the way back to Pangaea and prior to it breaking up. And this was actually an area of Earth, or at least an area of landmass that was way further south than it is now, almost residing near the Tropic of Capricorn. Because of this, it would have been likely considerably warmer than it is today, and as a result, this cordyceps may have done better in this area than it would currently. Over time, as Pangaea broke apart, any cordyceps on the surface that was able to survive would have found itself struggling more and more as the climate shifted to be colder. Now, typically, an adaptive response would have kicked in, but this didn't seem to happen with this specific strain of cordyceps. Other strains survive, which we see today. The cordyceps in super deep, however, would retreat underground towards the warmth, where it would ultimately move so deep that the air temperature would rise to 200 degrees Celsius. Once here, it's unclear how it obtained nutrients, but it was likely due to the brittleness of the rocks, or at least because they were in a softer state. The cordyceps may have actually been able to extract minerals and nutrients from the surrounding rocks more readily, which is why that cavern may actually be cleared out as it's eating everything, but ultimately the cordyceps adapted to this environment, which also don't forget, we do have extremophiles that live near ocean hydrothermal vents right now, where the water can regularly reach over 700 degrees Fahrenheit, which comes out to 371 degrees Celsius. So a paltry 200 degrees Celsius would be completely survivable to a species that was adapted to it. But because the temperature is so high upon infecting humans, the mold would have some difficulty. Being just warm enough to survive, it's almost like humans entering the area where the mold lives. Sure, we can survive in it for a time, but it's not comfortable. The mold would feel the same way likely living within our bodies, and subsequently this would make us feel cold, as the mold does appear to have control over specifically the hypothalamus, which controls the body's thermostat. And this is why I believe there is some interaction with the brain, possibly indirectly at first, as the hypothalamus receives information from temperature-sensitive receptors in the skin and circulatory system, in which, considering the mold is cold, and also subduing the immune system, would indicate that it's not the immune system spiking the body temperature due to the infection, but that it's actually the mold screwing with these cells and receptors, telling the brain to crank up the heat in order to warm the mold. It can do this by secreting substances that affect the nerves themselves. Ultimately, I do not believe the mold to be sentient or anything. It is simply doing what life does, wanting to survive. And as such, any stimuli in the area, which would be human activity, is noted and infected in order to spread the colony. From here, the mold would control the bodies, but not with conscious thought. Instead, with something as comparable as to breathing automatically, which by the way, you're breathing manually now, because at first, you really don't have to think about it. You just do it. Same with the mold. It doesn't think about infecting and spreading, it just does it. 